Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 18. We were looking at verse 3 where it says, Sin and shame go together. If you lose your honor, you will get scorn in its place. And that's one of the results of sin, that we lose our testimony before others. And once we have lost our testimony, it's very difficult to regain it. And that's why we have to be watchful that we do not bring reproach on the Lord's name. Verse 4, Proverbs 18, The words of a man's mouth are deep waters, and the fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Uh, two things spoken of here. One is depth and the other is freshness, like a spring. And here it says that the words of our mouth should have a depth in them and there should be a freshness in them. And that is one of the results of wisdom. That the more we acquire the wisdom that's spoken of in the book of Proverbs, the more value there comes in the words that we speak and there is a freshness in what God gives to us to share with others. And this should be our goal, that in all of our uh, giving God's word to one another, and I'm not just thinking of the meeting, I'm thinking of the many times that we meet other people and meet one another and we talk together, that there should be a depth. The world is characterized by a tremendous shallowness in their speech. They are only interested in shallow earthly things. And uh, even with believers sometimes, that is the case, most of the case, most, most cases. And also, not only depth, but freshness. When we are in touch with God, there, will, there won't be anything stale or stinking in what we have to say. There will be a freshness. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters, the fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Verse 5, to show partiality to the wicked is not good, nor to thrust aside the righteous in judgment. Now that's very plain and self-evident, and that is a description of how folly has taken over in the courts of law in this world, particularly manifested in the case of the judgment of Jesus himself where the righteous was thrust, thrust aside in judgment. Verse 6 and 7. I want to read this to you in the Living Bible. Proverbs 18, verse 6 and 7. A fool gets into constant fights. His mouth is his undoing. His words endanger him. And um, as we have seen, the book of Proverbs has much to say about the use of our tongue. And here it says a fool gets into fights because of the way he uses his tongue. And none of us would like to consider ourselves fools according to the teaching of Proverbs. But if we create a fight by our words, then we have to remember that the word of God calls us fools. If you kick up a row with a shopkeeper with the words you speak, you're a fool. Or you kick up a row with your husband or wife by the words you speak, according to God's word, you're a fool. A fool gets into constant fights. And people who get into fights, the word of God says, are fools. And it's amazing how we can deceive ourselves tremendously in this area. And the Holy Spirit had to emphasize through James that let no one deceive himself, he says in James 1.26, if a man cannot control his tongue, his religion is worth zero. Whatever doctrine he may believe. And here is where the devil deceives people that because of an increase in their knowledge of scripture, they are becoming spiritual. But it is not an increase of the knowledge of scripture that makes us spiritual, it's a control of our tongue. Yeah, and so we have to take these words seriously. A fool gets into constant fights, his mouth is his undoing, his words endanger him. 
Or as the Good News Bible says, when a fool speaks, he's ruining himself. That's something we don't realize. That our words pollute us. And Jesus said, by our words, we will be justified. And by our words, we will be condemned. And the fool ruins himself and he gets caught in the trap of his own words. So words is something that the book of Proverbs speaks much about. And we need to take that seriously if we are interested in wisdom. Verse 8. What dainty morsels uh, rumors are. Or as the Good News Bible says, gossip is so tasty. How we love to swallow it. If we find gossip tasty, like we have considered before, then that is perhaps why people supply it constantly to our house. It's, it's just like various uh, vegetable vendors and fishmongers and people who sell meat or any other thing stop by our house because they have found from past experience that we regularly buy that. In the same way, gossip mongers also stop by those houses where they find people are regularly uh, giving a ready year to that type of thing. As we have seen before, supply meets demand. And we cannot blame just the person who spreads the gossip. We have to see that this particular person has come to my house because he has found from past experience that I give my year to this type of gossip. That gossip is tasty to me and that I love to swallow it. So when a gossip monger comes to my place, if he's coming for the first time and he doesn't know who I am, it's another thing. But if it's a person who comes every now and then to spread some gossip, then I have to see that is an indication of my condition. You see, a fishmonger will never keep coming to your house if every time you turn him away at the gate and say, we don't want any fish. After a few days, he won't come. The supply is because there is a demand from within that house. That's something we must remember. And that's how we drive all these gossip mongers far from us. Because we are not interested in it. We do not consider gossip tasty. And yet the word of God says it is to many people like that. Verse 9. In the Good News Bible it says, A lazy person is, ba is as bad as someone who is destructive. Now, we wouldn't think of classifying a person who is destroying property in the same category, put him in the same category as a lazy person, but the Bible does. He says a person who is lazy is exactly the same as a person who is destructive. And this is one of the themes which the book of Proverbs brings forth. It's very good that we can read these words again and again because when something is repeated again and again and again, it's like a father writing a letter to a son who is far away. And he repeats something many, many times in the letters. Then you know that's something important. Something very important. And there we see words, diligence. These are the things the book of Proverbs emphasizes tremendously. Verse 10 of Proverbs chapter 18. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. This is a beautiful verse. Proverbs 18.10 Our security is in the name of the Lord. And that name in the Old Testament represents the nature of God. The nature of God is love. God is love. That's his name. Father. That's his name. Jesus. That's his name. And we know that all those names symbolize something that brings security to us. And then it's like a tower. We run into it and say, Jesus, I see who you are in the scriptures. Father, I see who you are in the scriptures. I know you are love, perfect love. And I find my security in that. And I don't have any fear. I was reading something very encouraging today, how very often... Christians can be tortured by preachers who tell them God's not doing anything for you because of your unbelief. When the person is crying out to God for help 
And so many people can get into bondage in this area. We can think that if, uh, to use an illustration, this is the illustration that this person used. He says, if my son were lying in a pit or something like that and was crying out to me for help and I was a father, I wouldn't dream of asking, do you trust me? Let me see if you've got faith. I wouldn't think of asking him all that. I would go and help him. The very fact that he calls out to me proves that he believes that I can help him. And we don't have to torture ourselves into thinking, do I have faith? Do I have faith? If I call out to the Lord, that proves that I trust him. That's why I call out to him. And his name is love. Sometimes we can get the idea of God as a sort of a tyrant. Here I am lying in the pit. And I'm saying, Daddy, help me. And he says, let me see, you've got faith. Oh, I see a little bit of unbelief there. Sorry, you've got to stay there in the pit. That's an insult to think that God is like that when a father won't treat his own son like that. And we can get into that type of bondage. Oh, there's a wee bit of unbelief there, so God leaves me in the pit. It's ridiculous. The name of the Lord, his nature, is loving. And let me never forget that. Let me get my security there. It's a strong tower. I run into it and I'm safe. And the doors are wide open. Praise God. But on the other hand, you know what are the two masters? God and Mammon, of course. Jesus said that. There are only two masters, God and Mammon. So, the rich man, his strong tower is his money. And, but it's only in his imagination. In other words, he thinks that he's getting security in money. And here's the contrast in verses 9, 10 and 11, sorry. For the righteous, their security is in the name and the nature of the Lord. They know God is love. For the person of the world, his security is in money and in earthly things. And so we find that here is something, an area where we can profitably examine ourselves to see where we find our security. Is it in the nature of a God who is perfect love or in something earthly which in my imagination is this is the thing that will protect me. I've got a job in an office or in a factory from which I cannot be terminated because of the wonderful trade unions that are there to fight. What a security there is there, isn't it? Unlike some of these other fellows who are not in a place where there are secure trade unions to fight for them. It's amazing how believers can have their confidence more in trade unions helping them, even though they don't join those trade unions, but they are thankful that they are there because it makes their job secure in the office or factory and it is not in God. It isn't. In their imagination, it is this earthly thing that protects me, that gives me uh, leave travel concession, gives me provision for medical expenses and so many things. And my security is in that. It's amazing how easily the flesh has such a tremendous tendency to lean upon the arm of flesh. And that's why there's a curse. There's a curse, it says, upon those who lean upon the arm of flesh. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Blessed are you if your confidence is not in anything earthly, but in the Lord and the Lord alone. My security is in him. If I seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, I don't need any trade unions or leave travel concessions or medical benefits or X, Y, or Z. The name of the Lord is more than sufficient. I have to be very careful that my wall of security around me and my family is not the uh, terms and conditions laid down in my appointment order. Then I'm serving the wrong master. Then I can never make progress in my Christian life. The blessing is on those who lean upon the Lord and who trust Him.